Okay, are there any questions to Holger or, or his team? I, I'm very happy that also some people of your team have actually joined. So, so it's very great to have them here as well. Thank you very much. Are there questions to Holger? I see Franz. I, I don't yeah, I actually oh, have some questions. Um, so in the last slide, you actually showed Apache Spark and what you showed about the Krangle library reminded me a lot of Spark because there's also data frame processing, there's type stuff versus untyped. Uh, it's, it's already a while ago that I worked with Spark, but theoretically you, it would be available in Kotlin via the JVM, right? So yes, there's actually, yes, there's actually pretty good Spark support, but, uh, and, and if you know Spark and have a Spark cluster, I, I think their APIs are pretty efficient and, and fun to use. I think there's even some kind of IDE tooling available. The thing is for sure that not everyone has Spark. So if I have a simple tabular data uh, set, I probably don't want to spin up a Spark cluster just to analyze it. And without the Spark cluster, the Spark APIs are not usable. Okay. But you're right. I mean, conceptually, I mean, they, they go into the same direction, yes. And we, we, if, uh, maybe one, one, one further question, uh, comment. And for sure, the, uh, with Spark, you would have an entirely different, you could achieve a different level of scale because Krangel is all in memory. It's probably not the most efficient uh, uh, representation of, of the data. I mean, it's all vectorized, but still, with Spark, I think they have yeah, an entirely different idea about scale, uh, which we, we cannot even come close to with Krangel. We have Wildan here in the back. Yeah, um, I have questions. So I haven't seen really about the automation process from the data engineering to data science with, that you explained to me uh, today. Um, I mean, normally we have kind of uh, many data which, which we download from some sources and then we extract transfer load in kind of relational database and then we make can pre-processing of the data. And then we forecast the data and we create kind of this, this loop, uh, the continuous integration. That's what we normally do in the department. And there is another, another system as well, based on like a graph database. Um, based on your experience, I mean, in, in the semiconductor company, um, which method they use, which method you use when you connect to database, the big database for scaling? I mean, do you use, um, best the, the 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 graph database which i mean neo 4g and then chrono database and something like that or you stick to the conventional method um kind of with relational database mostly sql and something like that so also can be scaling and can also with semiconductor company they have lots of money with uh, normally they have oracle uh, i think with kotlin as well um it's possible but i mean based on your experience which method do you use, or is that depends on the customer as well, or and how do you do you, I mean, make these continuous things? I, I think there's no common theme. Uh, like every customer has its own preference and also its own IT history and landscape. So I think there's no common scheme here. Some of uh, our partners they have Hadoop clusters. They use Spark on top of it. Some, a lot of them actually indeed rely on Oracle. I mean, there's some transition to MS SQL, uh, so SQL Server, but uh, there's also, I mean, uh, more open source type of softwares being used like Postgres databases, MongoDB, a lot of customers use Elastic. So and in particular, in this very complex uh, manufacturing uh, environments, they rarely rely on one system, but they have multiple systems which they explore in parallel. and. It, they, they always want to uh, consolidate their IT, but they never manage. And yeah, it's uh, always a bit scattered in my experience. And it's also one of the, the, the tasks for us when we want to improve and optimize the process to really get all the data uh, we need to, to analyze and understand an area or an entire site. As it is really challenging. It usually takes quite a while because the data is so scattered. And, and furthermore, uh, even in complex high automation industries, there's also gaps in digitization. I think that's something which is often underestimated, but very often not everything is available in a digital form. Uh, and then it's really the first question, okay, how can we make this dig uh, digitally available? So what's the state of an equipment if there's no digital readout at the beginning? It becomes really hard to understand and optimize the process. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have an, I have another question. As you as you uh, probably not on your on your presentation, but you already mentioned continuous systems, which are, which I really like because many of the systems we're looking at are actually continuous time systems. And uh, you also mentioned working with a cluster, and we were wondering. Um, since since then, parallel programming becomes, so to say, imperative to be fast enough. Um, how do you integrate modern parallel programming stats? I saw, I, I guess, what what I saw with you right now was basically a P-thread front end or something like that, uh, uh, telling me you you were we, you were working on several NIC systems. Um, are, are there more elaborate ways to to work on, uh, for example, uh, multi-core? architectures or even many core architectures yes. and how would you how would you approach that yes it's a very good question uh, so uh, when i was at the max Planck institute i mean we did lots of supercomputing at the tu dresden uh, taurus system and uh, i think it was a good system because we could really set up carefully what we wanted to do we were running our jobs and then we could carefully look into the data but uh, in industry in a particular manufacturing you have different requirements because Whenever you have a system that actually relates to the real production process, you need to be almost real time. So you cannot have this delayed approach where you take the data and then you do stuff. But if you really want to optimize and also contribute to the production planning, it must be a, a very close to real time. So your data architecture also needs to reflect that. And I think one of the most prominent and, uh, um, and worked out uh, approaches these days is Apache Kafka, where you can really, uh, uh, where you get a streaming API with very good semantics about how to model your, your business uh, logic. And at the say, uh, same time, you get persistence. So you also enable historical type of analysis and you get a basically arbitrary scale depending on how much money you want to spend on the hardware. Okay, thank you. More questions. I think I have this last question. Wildan is here again. <laughs> Wildan was faster this right. time. I'm sorry. Uh, could could you uh, predict? I think the lifetime of Kotlin uh, is oh. it like ten years? Uh, we still use again. <laughs> I mean, like normally uh, we have like a core of programming like C, C plus plus and Java, and I see this based on Java as well. So yeah. I mean, if we spend time on this, like. Uh, really seriously and then are they going to use it in 10 years or I, I don't know what's your prediction <laughs> I mean I, I found out like of, of uh, TypeScript like this and uh, they call it x you know if you yeah. know that so we can build kind of the programming language based on this thing yeah. but I mean I don't know based on your knowledge and more experience in Kotlin how could you yeah. predict in five or ten years I think I, I'm R and uh, Python is very powerful for the last 10 years. So when we learn that, okay, we can really use it, but I don't know. I mean, because it's only appears in 2015 and there is another language based on Java. It's also sometimes they collapse as well. So they don't develop anymore. And how do you predict about Kotlin? That's a very tricky question. And even if I do build predictive models for a living, I can barely answer this question. I see, okay. <laughs> I mean, at the moment, I think there's very strong support because uh, with uh, Google promoting Kotlin as a primary language to do um, ap uh, Android application development, I think uh, and until they drop this support, I think it will be a, a very well supported language. And also we have JetBrains, which is a, one of the biggest tooling vendors in the, uh, for, for, for editing and IDEs. I think they uh, also support this with a very big team but I think for the foreseeable future, I think yeah, it will be well supported. But maybe Alexander, you're much closer yeah. to, to JetBrains. Maybe you can help out here. <laughs> yes, I saw yes. Alexander, I, yes. I like your working place, actually. That's a good <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the <laughs> I'm the emperor. Yeah, uh, I'm partially affiliated with the JetBrains, not JetBrains itself, but JetBrains Research, but it's pretty close. So it's a disclaimer. And yes, uh, answering the question, uh, I do not think it will die in the near future because it's uh, the whole Android and a significant part of web backend. For example, Spring 
now supports uh, Kotlin as a first class citizen and other, uh, there is a huge uh, market share uh, moves to Kotlin from Java or mixed project in the backend. So it won't die anytime soon. As for another support, I also wanted to comment that JetBrains itself puts a lot of effort uh, to support this data science and science ecosystem. For example, you saw that's plot, it's a JetBrains product. They also have a data frame, which is actually a, something, a derivative work from what uh, Holger here does, the data frame. Uh, I, I can say it's better. It's maybe a next iteration. It's, it's the same, but it's a little bit different. And of course, they're integrating it with different tools, for example, databases and uh, Spark API, which I sent you earlier, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And a lot of community libraries there. So I think in future. And also, I would like to comment on uh, multi threat environment. I also commented during the talk. It is quite easy to uh, transform, for example, Colosseum to the full multi threat environment. If you want. And uh, it is not done, not done yet because uh, Holger uses uh, sequence API, which is single threaded by default, but it's possible to promote it to fully use core teams and make it not only uh, multi-threaded, but also uh, allow a perfect remote uh, asynchronous execution. So you can scale your simulation across different machines that uh, even not in a homogeneous cluster, like you usually use, but in a, heterogeneous class where different machines do different work. It's hard to imagine such things without a strongly typed uh, language with a good uh, network infrastructure. So you can do those things in Python. And also like Giuseppe mentioned, you can't uh, use a lot of functions in Python. Maybe you, you can in R, I'm not a specialist in R, but in Python, it's a real pain. And uh, the functions are very important for new types of simulation. For example, Bison simulation rely a lot on manipulating with functions, not with matrices, but with functions. And of course, uh, you can do it effectively in uh, Python. Thank you very much, Alexander, for that clarification. Um, Hans, we have, you have another question or is this an old hand? If I may, uh, Franz, do you want to speak about uh, this topic or I just want to add another things? Okay, Giuseppe, go ahead and then yeah. we have Franz. It, it was about this, Franz, or was another question? No, no uh, I was another question. Okay, I'll, I'll just be very quickly uh, and head uh, for um, Bill Dan that <coughs> about Kotlin, that is one of the most, is one of the fastest growing languages um, in terms also on, on the GitHub um, uh, number of repository adopting Kotlin is open source. So in case JetBain will ever drop it, community can, can still uh, take over and then continue the developing. Mm -hmm. And also is one of the most loved languages um, together with Swift Rust on the, on the Stack Overflow um, survey. So this is just to give a... Um, an additional context about the... <laughs> yeah, unless you want to write your simulation in Rust. Thanks, <laughs> please. Okay, I also have uh, two questions, uh, generic questions on Kotlin. Um, the first, okay, what, what was the first even? Ah, okay, in the beginning, you mentioned that um, Kotlin can compile to different targets and I'm um, just having a question on how exactly that works. So do you have to decide upfront when you begin a project that this is going to be a JVM project, that is going to be a native project, or can you just take any Kotlin project that already exists and decide no. to now compile it to native? No, no, you can actually, I mean, it's the same language and you can basically, I mean, for sure you have need some kind of build definition, but uh, you have some kind of, I mean, I think you see my screen still? Yes, you do it, don't you? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, we can really reuse the same code base uh, and then compile against different backends. So you can really go native, you can go JVM and you can go for JavaScript. And in order to facilitate this, I think around the common core Kotlin language, they, they also provide some kind of uh, support libraries to provide, uh, to make the binding a bit more uh, seamless. And maybe okay. Alexander, maybe you can also uh, explain this in a better way. I've never talked about uh, multi-platform. 
Yeah, I think Giuseppe planned another seminar exactly on that with the ex uh, detailed. Uh, uh, I'm going to go into detail and show how it works. Yeah. Exactly with uh, how it works, for example, with uh, uh, Jupyter and how you how you can do both back end and front end. I, I mean, doing visualization for Jupyter with the okay. Cotton JS. And I, I, I mean, personally, I haven't used it, but I find it really interesting because I just know Kotlin. I mean, I know some other languages, but let's just pretend that I just know Kotlin and I'm very good in it. And uh, then I can really decide when I'm not happy with my JVM performance, I could really make sure that I use uh, the common Kotlin only and then uh, compile it against uh, in, uh, into a native piece of code to potentially squeeze out more performance for some more mission critical uh, pieces. But I think this is a very interesting opportunity. And also when you do a web development, you can really then share some parts of your code base between the, 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 the front end, like what's running in the browser and, browser, and also uh, with, with the server side backend. I think it's really interesting model uh, to, to um, use here. Okay. That's also one thing that fascinated me about the language. That's why I asked, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the other question I have is that a lot of the problems uh, that Python or R or these languages have, they are known in the data science community. And one common answer for that, or one emerging answer is uh, language Julia. Uh, that I think seems to approach many of the same problems that also you see being solved by Kotlin. So here with the... What is the relation that you see between Julia and Kotlin, or is there any relation? I, I mean, I, I also looked into Julia. I mean, there, there is this uh, Julia simulation uh, program, which is very popular. I think Julia Sim. Uh, so I also uh, investigated some time to understand how this thing is working. And I think in general, it's, it's an interesting language, but it really lacks the tooling support and the ecosystem because there's just so few Julia libraries compared to what I can get for the JVM. And so what I can immediately bring into a simulation model. That's why at the moment for me, it's not such a, an interesting thing, but I, I'm pretty sure there's communities and there's use cases which really uh, uh, love Julia, I'm, I'm sure about that. I, I don't want to talk bad about it, but personally regarding what I want to do, I think you, uh, building on top of this very, very huge JVM ecosystem and the excellent tooling I can get with something like Kotlin is, is, a, more, uh, is a better choice. I think I can clarify on this as well, because we, are, we try to work with Julia and we still have some projects on Julia and uh, in my opinion, Julia is the second best solution. Uh, if you go to want to do a modern scientific computing, I do not mean only the data, data science, uh, but it's second. Uh, as Holger said, there are still a lot of problems with tooling. Uh, tooling is, in Julia is not even close to Kotlin. And a lot of, uh, when you're doing those uh, computation, the computations in Julia uh, are easier because a lot of libraries uh, specific, uh, specialized in computations and Julia have access almost to the whole uh, Python system. But when you go to the network stack, uh, multi-threading, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's a real pain. And of course, Julia inherits some problem for Python. It has a type, uh, it has types, optional types, but still uh, it's not so evolved in terms of types as uh, mm -hmm. Kotlin is. So yeah, we tried this and we tried that. And uh, for some complex problems, like uh, Holger mentioned, I think Kotlin is still better. But Julia is nice as well, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? If that's not the case, I have one comment to make. One comment to make. We are very crazy here. Uh, so we, we uh, I, I personally grew up with a lot of languages and I still adapt to new languages, which is very nice. So I like uh, seeing static typing coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm an old person, I like that. <laughs> I like to understand what I'm doing with my data. So I like, love this very much. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are also coming from a very strong HPC background in some cases. And so uh, this is more like a comment than anything else. What I really like is you integrating 
um, into, into a Jupyter framework and using it, I think that's for rapid prototyping and, and, and doing large scale data analysis to the scale is a, is a really nice thing. And one of the things that we are working on and, and we have been working on on quite a while, I'm not sure if you, if, do you know the Xeus project? No. So uh, uh, you, you probably know CERN. Yes. <laughs> okay. <fair. laughs> so Alexander is, Alexander is, is <laughs> I think he knows what I'm talking about. So, so one, uh, one of the things that we have been working with is exactly putting C++ into, uh, with a JIT compiler into, into Xeus and especially also supporting uh, many core libraries. So I think there is some some way of of talking about these kind of things and 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 really going towards towards performant uh, uh, execution on large scale systems. And I know from your company that might not be uh, the way to go in terms of really doing HPC with a company, but I think just from a technical point of view, I see some some possible ways to also talk about this because for us finally uh, discrete systems are nice and we use them in a lot of cases uh, uh, but uh, going to continuous systems and getting some power there is also very interesting on a side note we also have a uh, parallel random, random number generator uh, project running. So if you want to jump into that and, and talk to us about that, that this is also an overlap. So I think we have some technical overlaps as well, despite the whole uh, ecosystem we are interested in working with you. Definitely, yes. <clears throat> okay, and you're very close actually, so we can actually come over or you can come over at one point and do it, do it in person. So that's also yeah. pretty nice. Definitely, I'm looking forward to that. Mm. Also, I have, a, I have a very personal question. You don't have to answer, but uh, 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 what's what? Why Bielefeld? Oh, I actually <laughs> studied. <laughs> I studied in Greifswald, uh, but ah. there was no good IT department, and I wanted something with computer science in my uh, thesis project. So I talked to somebody in Bielefeld, did my uh, diploma thesis there about speaker recognition and speaker modeling. And then I just stayed there for the uh, PhD thesis. Oh my goodness, this is my place of birth. So I'm, I have a very, <laughs> <laughs> I just saw Bielefeld and my, my heart lighted up. So very nice to hear somebody yes. has been in Bielefeld and can actually claim that it exists. So thank it you very much. It definitely <laughs> exists. I have some good, very good memories of, of Bielefeld. So. <laughs> okay, I'm finished. A small comment about high performance computing because I've just made a talk on Joker conference about that and I promised Giuseppe to invite your people when uh, I will repeat it in English for open auditory. And yes, there is a lot of effort uh, right now in researching different possibilities to make high performance computing in Kotlin. And yes, you can do a pretty um, effective computation in pure Kotlin JVM right now. With, which is, uh, and for example, KMAC project is oriented to integrate in different libraries and do it very well. Of course, native optimizations are usually better because they include optimization for specific hardware. But right now we are working, working on integrating very performant libraries like TensorFlow, Torch, which is, uh, could also be called easily uh, from Kotlin, like there are they are from Python, for example. So yeah, in the nearest future, we can do uh, flexible and very high performance computing in Kotlin as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Giuseppe, I have the last words to you since you have been organizing this. And I think, I, I just personally want to thank our speaker today, Holger Brandl, but also his, his colleagues for joining in. That was a very intense seminar and a very nice one. Uh, so thank you very much for spending your time with us. And for the last words, I hand over to Giuseppe from our side. Thank you very much, Olgar, for uh, hosting uh, and take part of the event. And uh, yeah, um, I wish you all the best. Maybe we can, we can talk again for uh, some other topics that we can further uh, 
go deeper and uh, elaborate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, all for joining. It was really a pleasure for me uh, talking to you. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me and I hope to stay in touch with you uh, very soon. Okay. Have a nice day. Have See you, everybody. Bye-bye.